Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Love, Truth, and Spirit Ministries. We're so blessed to have you here this morning. Let's open up in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you, Jesus, for this day, Lord God in heaven. We thank you for your presence in our hearts, in our minds, in our homes. Lord God in heaven, breathe life into us in this season, Father. There are so many people who are hurting, Father, so many people in need, and this is supposed to be a season of joy. We're celebrating the birth of you, Jesus. We are celebrating our walk with you. We're celebrating your uh, your graciousness, Father, that, and y that you bestow upon us. All of these things, Father, that we are grateful for because you have called us, you have uh, sought us, you have died on the cross for us, Lord God in heaven. And we just want to thank you. We want to be so thankful for the things that you do. We want to pray for Israel to keep the army safe, Father, to keep the people of Israel safe. We want to pray for all of our armed service people who are, you know, on the front lines doing the hard work, the first responders, the firemen, the ambulance drivers, the doctors, Lord God in heaven, protect them, protect us, Father, as we continue to seek you, uh, to want to learn more about you, Father God in heaven. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen. <clears throat> so we're going to continue on in our journey in the book of Romans. We're in chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. And this is really where Paul starts to hit home the transition from uh, the law of Moses versus Jesus Christ and following Jesus Christ. And he does a wonderful job in setting up the Holy Spirit in us. We can't follow Christ unless we have the Holy Spirit. We can't be in the presence of the Lord spiritually unless we have the Holy Spirit in us. A lot of people think that they can uh, short circuit uh, the Holy Spirit, short circuit Jesus and go straight to God. And that's what was happening in the Old Testament, by the way. They were sacrificing through blood. They were sacrificing uh, through prayer. All of these things that were being sacrificed in the Old Testament have been fulfilled through the death, the birth, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Paul is now addressing the Roman church in such a way that um, there's no turning back now. And we know Paul, we, he is uh, diligent, he's resilient in his message. And what we need to understand is that message was not only for the Roman church or the Roman people, it's for each and every one of us. We discuss this quite often that, you know, the Bible is living. It pertains to our lives today, tomorrow. It pertained to our life yesterday. <clears throat> this is the beauty of the living word. It lives within us. It guides us. It protects us. It admonishes us when we're sinning, when we're in a sinful uh, uh, way. So th the word is living in us. And we have to remember that. Why do we remember that? If the word is in us, if the Holy Spirit is in us, if we are... Uh, close to Jesus, if we're developing a personal relationship with Jesus, we're getting closer to God. And what does that mean for you and I? That means that we become heirs of God. By the way, that's the title of today's message. We are, we become heirs of God. How do we do that? Excuse me. We do that by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ, by accepting not accepting, uh, that's the wrong word to use. We receive Jesus Christ by acknowledging, that's the better word, by acknowledging that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Jesus is the Son of God. When we acknowledge those things, when we give reverence to the Lord Jesus Christ, that gets us closer to God. Remember, Jesus is our mediator to the Father in heaven. The Holy Spirit is our check and balance 
into being able to approach Jesus and approach God. Remember, we're going to live with Jesus for eternity. <coughs> we're going to live with God the Father for eternity. We're going to live with the Holy Spirit for eternity. So what better time than now to get acquainted with Jesus, to know who he is, to understand the sacrifice he gave for you and I, to understand his Father, to understand, fully understand the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will convict us, as we know. The Holy Spirit will guide us. He will bring to our remembrance the teaching of Jesus. These are the things the Holy Spirit does. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as we continue on in uh, the message, the therefore that begins in verse 12 is in response to the statements made in the previous uh, section, verses 9 through 11, that therefore, so Paul gives a statement and then he gives a therefore to the statement, which backs up what he's saying. Paul concludes the statement by stating that we receive Christ when we receive Christ. We are no longer uh, associated with the world. We are no longer beholden to the flesh. And this is a hard concept, I think, not for uh, many, but for some. That when we receive Christ, we're supposed to release ourselves uh, from the f world. You know, and when I say we're supposed to release ourselves... The only way we can do that is through the strength of Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit in us. Again, the triune God who lives in us will help us to release the world's sin. We all know that Satan was thrown off uh, the clouds. We all know if you read Isaiah 14, you'll find out quickly that he was cast into this earth and this became his domain. We know this. If you don't know this, if you're a new Christian or if you're just starting out and reading your word, read Isaiah 14. It is a great example of how Satan gets thrust into the, into the world. Why? Because he wanted to be greater than God. He wanted to sit at least at the same level of God, looking God straight in the eye and being as great as God. And nobody can do that. As exampled by God throwing Satan off. And by the way, he takes a third of the angels. So you don't think Satan has influence. Just remember, he threw a third of the angels, took them with him. And they followed him to his domain, now the world. So what's Paul trying to convince us of? If we have the Holy Spirit in us, if we have Jesus in us, if we are reverencing God the Father, then we are supposed to separate ourselves from the sins of the world. I say this often, and sometimes I just make a blanket statement, but what really is transpiring here is as we have the Holy Spirit in us, as God is growing in us, as Jesus, as we grow closer to Jesus, the things, the sins of the world should grow farther and farther away. They should become diminished in our lives. And we should openly acknowledge when we're sinning and seek forgiveness to the Lord and pray. And if we sin against someone, what does the Bible teach us? Go up to them. And seek forgiveness. If someone sins, uh, if if someone is sinning against us, we should also have that same forgiveness. And it's really important what Paul is telling us here. He's giving us a glimpse into how we transform our lives, and that transformation takes place with the Holy Spirit in us. It is first and foremost. But he also reminds us that once we are transformed into the kingdom of heaven. We become heirs to God the Father. Just as e Jesus is an heir to the throne, we are heirs to the throne. 
We're not on the same level as Jesus. We're not on the same level as God. But we are heirs. We become children, men and women and chil- of men, women and children, sons and daughters of God. That's who we become. So who do we represent? We represent our Father in heaven, His Son, the Holy Spirit. That's who we represent. And what Paul is saying is, as we live a life with Christ in our lives, a transformation has to take place. And if it's not taking place, then you have to question, are you truly living for God? Are you truly, do you truly have the Holy Spirit in you? If you're off sinning every day and you don't think anything of it, you know, do you really have the Holy Spirit in you? Are you seeking uh, to fulfill your uh, fleshly desires? If you're seeking and thinking about those desires on a daily basis, but profess to be a Christian, do you really have the Holy Spirit in you? And this is what Paul is going to set up. As we progress through Romans, we're going to find out that y- you cannot be a child of God and live the life that you have been living. You know, if it's, uh, if it's steeped in sin, if it's steeped in, uh, you know, the debauchery and, and the immorality that is associated with the world, you just can't do it. And it's very, very difficult to live that life. And we have to understand that. You know, in God's word, God gives us hope. God gives us guidance. He tells us how we should be living. When we live by the Spirit, we're living for God. We become the sons and daughters. We become heirs. You can live a full life to the fullest extent that God has designed your life to be if you are following God. Some may say, well, I have a full life now and I don't think twice about God. Unfortunately, you may be living a full life, but you're not living a full life with Christ. And unfortunately, your life will come to an end and you'll spend eternity in hell where others who follow Christ, who are living the life that God has given us, will live for eternity also, but will be living in the kingdom of heaven. Don't be confused about a couple of facts. Fact number one, whether you're a Christian, a believer, a true believer, or if you don't believe, you have an eternal, eternal life waiting for you. One is going to be in hell. The other will be in heaven. There is no gray area. There is no other place that we're going to end up living in. It's either you're going to be living in damnation in hell or you're going to be living in the glory in the presence of God the Father, the triune God, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's your choices. You know, we want to water down those things to make ourselves feel good. We want to say, you know what, oh, you know, there may be a place where we can rest and people will pray for us. And then, you know, once God hears our prayers, then we're, hold on one second, please. Anyways, um, that is the message that we're speaking about. Let's look at Ephesians 6.16. And Ephesians 6.16 says this. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. So when we're in the battle, when we're being pummeled, you know, there'll be fiery darts 
that will come at us. And the only way we can protect ourselves is if we're wearing, uh, you know, the armor of God and part of the arsenal or part of the equipment of the armor of God is the shield, the shield of faith. And when Satan comes at us because we're trying to live a better life, we need to recognize that on a daily basis. Paul tells us on a daily basis to do that. Another point we have to bring up and have to make is this, that we are not, um, we cannot parse, you know, uh, the triune God. What I mean by that is you can believe in God, but you don't believe in Jesus. You don't believe in the Holy Spirit or you believe in God and the Holy Spirit, but you don't believe in Jesus or you believe in Jesus, but you don't believe in God or the Holy Spirit. Our Christian walk doesn't work that way. We cannot parse out the triune God because it makes us feel good or, or this is what we were taught from an early age and this is what we believe. When you receive Christ, you receive the total package. You receive the Holy Spirit. You receive God the Father in heaven. There is no other way no other possibility that you can live a christian life without having the triune god the holy spirit god the holy spirit god the son god the father living in us we're the temples remember the bible teaches us we're the temples where the holy spirit where god the father where jesus lives And it is a package deal. You can't parse it. And you can't expect to be blessed if you are trying to parse it. The Holy Spirit is sent to us. We read this a, a few weeks ago. The Holy Spirit is sent to, uh, sent to us to convict us of our sins. To bring us to our remembrance, the teachings of Jesus. Also, to remind us and keep us on a straight and narrow path of who we are in Christ, who we are in the kingdom of heaven. It's really important that we understand that. And we need to acknowledge it every, every time. From the mo time we wake up in the morning till the time we go to bed, we should be multiple times a day acknowledging God, speaking to God, speaking to the Lord. Hearing the Holy Spirit tell us what's wrong, what's right. Guiding us on that path. Giving reverence to God, giving reverence to His Son. Through the Holy Spirit. That happens on a, a multiple time daily basis. Because that keeps us centered, that keeps us in focus on where God wants us to walk. We can lose focus very quickly. In an age where ADD is running rampant as an excuse, I believe, in some cases, not in all cases, but it's hard to stay focused. And this is where Satan wants you. He wants you in a state of confusion, in a, a taking your eyes off the Lord. And putting your eyes wherever they may lead you, except to God, because then He's winning the battle. And He's defeating you. He doesn't defeat God. He doesn't defeat Jesus. He doesn't defeat the Holy Spirit. He defeats you and I when we allow Him to do so. So let's get into our scripture. Let me do this. Romans 12:17 Therefore brethren we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh for if you live according to the flesh you will die but if by the spirit you are 
you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And these verse six verses are so powerful in our lives, you know, and it really impacts us. And like I said earlier, it sets up our continuous walk with Christ. It really reminds us. That we are heirs. We represent God. How many parents out there have children that they at most of the time are, you know, and I hate to say this, but are embarrassed of them because they say and they live in embarrassing lives. You know, how often do we embarrass our own parents by doing the things that we do as we try to, you know, mature in our lives, you know, as young kids growing all the way up. I can remember a lot of the silly things I did as a kid. I, re, I can remember a lot of the silly things my kids did also. And they are, as we raise our kids, as God raises us, we're supposed to represent our father, our parent in heaven, just as we expect our kids to represent their parents on earth. And there are moments where we have to discipline. There are moments where we have to be disciplined by our Father. There are moments where we have to remind our kids. There are moments where God has to remind us, again, through the Holy Spirit. How do we remind our kids? Sometimes we'll get, pass the message on uh, to the wife. The wife will convey it. God will pass his message on to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will convict us when we're wrong. You know, and the Holy Spirit is not just about uh, conviction and convicting us. The Holy Spirit will fill us with love. He will fill us with joy. He will bring us closer to God and the attributes of Jesus and God. So the Holy Spirit isn't this mean uh, person that is always looking to discipline us. Just like we're not mean parents always looking to discipline our kids. It's analogous. Each path we can see, God the Father, you know, how do we get to that path with the Holy Spirit in us through Jesus Christ? How do our kids get to us? Sometimes directly to us. Sometimes through other means. Anymore, you know, in, in today's day and age, they'll get to us mostly through texts. You know, a lot of people don't want to do face-to-face -face communication anymore. They are better off texting. And, and we've talked at nauseam about texting and how bad it is and how it uh, uh, but, uh, debilitates the ability to communicate anymore. People come up with their own text languages, which is kind of silly to me. Anyways, I divert. So let's break it down. Verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. And this is, a, again, we mentioned this earlier, is a continuation from the earlier verses. So therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh. We're in de debt to someone to live according to the flesh. Paul is not saying that as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, we are no longer in debt to the flesh. We are no longer beholden to the world. We have a father in heaven that we are now indebted to because he saved our lives. Jesus Christ went to the cross. He died on that cross and he was resurrected. Now he sits at the right hand of his father. For us. We are in debt to Jesus. The Holy Spirit, God has sent the helper to help us. We're in debt to God for that. We are in debt to the Holy Spirit because 
He helps us. He reminds us. We're no longer in debt to the world. This is what Paul is saying. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. How many times do we have to hear that? If you live according to the world standards, you are going to die. If you read Revelation, we'll go back to it. If you read Revelation, you are going to die as a non-believer, a second death. But those who follow Christ, the true believers, will die a first death. Because we all die, we're mortal. We're not immortal. We're mortal. So we're all going to die one death. But the Bible teaches us that the non-believer will die twice. We will die once. We will live for eternity. It says, but if the spirit you put to death, the deeds of the body, you will live. Right? So according to the flesh, you will die. But, but if you... By the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And again, this is sanctification. This is the process of separating ourselves from the sins of the world. And this is really important. Some people say, well, I'm a good person. Yeah, I know a lot of good people, but if you don't follow Christ, you may not make it into heaven. And when I say may, if you just flat out reject Christ, you will not make it into heaven. But if you are someone who believes that you're a good person and you do the right things and you don't follow Christ and you don't give God an opportunity and you just reject the, the premise that God and Jesus saved us, then you won't make it either. And this is Paul is giving us a clear picture. If you live according to the flesh, you will die according to the flesh. If you live according to the spirit, you will live for eternity. That's the way I understand it. That's the way I, what keeps me straight in my understanding. Will we fail? Yes, we fail. Is there forgiveness when we seek it from the Lord? When we fail, we must seek that forgiveness, and the Lord will forgive us. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So this is where Paul turns now and says, if you follow the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is in you. This is what Paul is saying. When the Holy Spirit is in you, the Spirit of God, you will live. You will live forever. We are sons of God. What does he mean by that? He means, you know, frame it in first century, males dominated. Okay, that's why he says, Paul says, sons of gods. But this expands to sons, daughters, children. Whomever follows Christ, whoever believes in God the Father, whoever sacrifices what they have in this world to follow God, will become an heir, will become a son, a daughter, a child of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out. So Paul's introducing this spirit of adoption. What does that mean? We are adopted into the kingdom of heaven. We're not born into it. We have to be adopted into it. What does adoption mean? I mean, from a, a, a very simplistic uh, term, we're orphans. We have no parents. I'm talking spiritually now. We live in a sinful-natured world. We choose to change our lives. God calls us. We receive the call. We acknowledge God. We want to live and change our lives. Once the Holy Spirit is in us, this is what Paul is saying, once the Holy Spirit is in us, we are now adopted into the kingdom of heaven. And this is the spirit of adoption. We are in now. We have been adopted by God the Father. The Holy Spirit is living in us. This is what Paul is... 
And, and what does it, it follows up by the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. We are acknowledging what God is doing in our lives. We are acknowledging how he's going to change our lives. We are acknowledging that we need God in our lives. And God is right there saying, come on in. I'm going to put a seat at the table for you. You are now my son, my daughter, the heir to the throne. Just as Jesus is the heir to the throne. We become heirs of God. It's not more complicated than that. Receive Jesus Christ. Receive God the Father. Change for God. Live by the precepts of the Bible, get in your word, stay in your word. Become a child, become an heir to the throne. Otherwise, you're lost for eternity. It's not more complicated than that. And Paul doesn't use a bunch of fancy words that complicate this message. And he gives us the why. The why is the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So the spirit bears witness with our spirit. Our spirits are connecting. And we are in unison. We are in one voice. We are in, I'll use the word simpatico, with God through the Holy Spirit. I want to back up just a minute. Verse 14 is the key verse here for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. These are sons of God. This is the key to what Paul is saying. If you're led by the Holy Spirit, you are a son of God. I don't want to gloss over that. I want you to remember that because it's important for us to, that we remember it. And then he says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And there's a lot of conditional statements going on here, but this last point in verse 17, if indeed we suffer with him, who is him? It's Jesus. The Bible teaches us as we receive Christ, we are going to suffer as Christ did. We will be persecuted by the world. We will be persecuted by what we perceived our friends are, uh, by who our friends are, by even our family members. Jesus tells us that brother will come against brother, mother against daughter, father against son. Why? Because there is a distinction between being filled with the Holy Spirit and being filled with the world. Those who are filled with the Holy Spirit can no longer live in the world and accept the world and the sins that they keep throwing at us. And I'll tell you, as you mature more, as you get into the Word more, as Jesus is breathing into you more and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you start to reject what the world has to offer as far as sin goes, as far as what's on TV, as far as what you read, what you hear. Because we are filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what distinguishes us from the world is we become children of God. It's like our kids. I'll go back to the analogy. We want our kids to be somewhat like us if we're successful. We want our kids to succeed. Matter of fact, a lot of parents, I think, make the mistake to say, you know what? I want my kids to be more successful than me. I was saying that for a long, long time until I realized that with God in me, with Christ in me, I have become successful. Not in the ways that the world perceives success. It is success through the Lord Jesus Christ, through living and honoring God. That's the success I want for my kids. And this is a success that Jesus wants for us. And God wants for us as children to him. He wants us to succeed. 
He wants us to be with him for eternity in the kingdom of heaven. But the only way we're going to get there is if we suffer. And I'm not saying you go out and purposefully suffer because it's going to come at you naturally. If you profess to be a Christian, if you profess to love Christ and you wear it on your sleeve everywhere you go, people will look at you differently. They will treat you differently. Now, in some cases, um, you know, it could get quite dangerous. In other cases, you know what? Uh, it's not as bad. But there is a perception. We know this. We know this through the last administration. And I'm not talking politics here. I'm just talking reality. We know this through COVID when it was shut down. What's the first thing the government wanted to do? Shut down all churches. If you're isolating people away from the church, how can they fellowship together? You know, we can do it online. We can do, uh, we have other mechanisms. But true fellowship requires people singing and worshiping God and reading God's word, sitting next to each other. So the Holy Spirit can fill the whole room. The Holy Spirit can fill us. The one thing I like about fellowship is, is this. If someone has a word, if God is speaking to someone, they'll be able to share with all of us. And then the Holy Spirit spills out on all of us. That's the importance of fellowship. Being in isolation, isolation just sets yourself up, I think, for uh, long-term failure. Near term, y you succeed with it. But we have to fellowship. And this is a diverging from what Paul is saying, but it's really not. You know, we are going to suffer. And it's better to suffer with brothers and sisters in Christ because we will all suffer in similar ways, not the same ways, but in similar ways. You know, we suffer by, you know, you show up for work and you can't talk about God in the workplace. That to me is suffering because it's inhibiting my belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. It inhibits me from sharing the good news, giving someone hope in Christ when we do that. Suffering wears many masks. If we are being stymied to share the word of God, to say Merry Christmas, to say Jesus loves you in public, that is suffering. Because we are asked to not share our parent. And let's just be quite clear. When we become sons and daughters, heirs of the throne, God becomes our true parent. And if he is our true parent, then we need to acknowledge it, recognize it, and propagate that message to everyone who hears it. We become heirs to Christ, finding life through Jesus, Romans 8, uh, 12, and 13. We become heirs of God. We find life through Jesus Christ. Receive and be led by the Spirit, Romans 8, 14, and 15. We need to receive the Spirit. It doesn't happen by osmosis. If you've got a family member or a, a spouse or someone, a friend who loves Christ, they'll share the love of Christ with you, but unless you love Christ, unless you receive Christ, it's not going to work. It doesn't happen by osmosis, just by being there. You know, absorption doesn't take place. You only open up the floodgate of the Holy Spirit when you openly acknowledge and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We're heirs of God. We're all heirs of God. Romans 8, 16 and 17. When you receive the Holy Spirit, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, that is the caveat. That is the conditional statement. Sin must be put to death. Sin should not exist in our lives. It does 
because I, I believe we have intentional sin and unintentional sin. We will always unintentionally sin. We make mistakes. But the intentional sin should go to almost zero or to zero. It must be put to death. Let's look at Colossians 3, 5. <laughs> Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. But what is Paul telling us in Colossians? We need to put to death the members. And he's not talking about our arms and legs now. The members he's talking about are those things that we just read, covetousness, evil, desires. Those are the members he's talking about. They need to die so Christ can live in us. We have an everlasting name. God gives us an everlasting name. If you read in Revelation, you're going to know you have a new name. In heaven, our name shall not be cut off. Let's look, Isaiah 56, 5. Even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Our names, our beings, our spirit will live for eternity in heaven with God. Jesus will deliver us. If you put your faith in Christ, if you put your hope in Christ, if you put your life in the hands of Christ, He will deliver us. What's the requirement? We need to turn away from the darkness. We need to turn that darkness into light. That's the criteria. Acts 26, 17, and 18. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. What is the scene there that Paul is experiencing? He's on his way to Damascus. He hears and sees Jesus. And Jesus' instruction to him is, I will send you to the Jews. And now I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. So you can share me with them. And we know how the story ends. Paul was obedient. And his word is entrenched and it's not his word it's God's word spoken by Paul God's inspired word spoken by Paul is entrenched in our hearts and minds forever which translates to God's word is entrenched in our hearts and minds but Jesus put Paul on a task are you on a task? What are you doing for God? I know it's a harsh question. People say, well, you know, why do you have to be so blunt about it? Because we live in times where time is short. And if you can't be blunt now, you know, uh, you're going to be in trouble if you're left behind. And we, you need to think about that seriously. There is no better time now to give your life to Christ, start living for Christ. Because we, A, don't know when our time is up. And B, we don't know when Jesus is going, or God is going to return, he's going to send his son to call a church. We, we, we don't know any of those factors. So to be diligent, to be uh, um, adherent, to the Lord, to God's word. We need to always be ready. Our lamps always must have oil. We must always be prepared for the return of, of the Son of God. And if we're not, then we are going to be left. We will fall short. Now, the good news and the hope is that if you are short, and you've fallen short, 
There's a way to get into heaven. It's not going to be very nice. And it will take a lot of courage. But you will get there. But you have to turn your life to Christ. But there will be a point where you must do it. Why not do it now? That's the question. Let's look at our encouraging verse. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The spirit of fear comes from the devil. We do not have fear when we have the Holy Spirit in us. Because we know where we're going to go. We have the power of Christ in us. The power of God is in us. If God is in us, who can come against us? That's a question. If God is in you, who can come against you? That is the question. And who knows? Only God knows. No one can come against us. And we have to be diligent. In our relationship with Jesus Christ, we have to be diligent in staying in His Word. We have to be diligent to serve God, to share the good news with others. That's on us. That's our part. God gives us every mechanism to follow Him, to lead a life that He's given to us. Now it's our part to receive it, to march forward without fear, because fear does not come with, uh, from God. With that, let's just close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we just thank you, Lord, Father, for this day. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord God in heaven, we just thank you that you have, uh, you breathe life into us, that through your power, Father, that you remove all the fear from us, Lord God in heaven, from serving you. And Lord God in heaven, we know that when you are in us, nothing can come against us. And we just thank you, Jesus, for this. And we thank you, Father, for providing uh, for us, for protecting us, for giving us an opportunity time and time again to follow you, Father, to pick us up when we fall, Father, to forgive us when we fail. Lord God in heaven, you are the God of many, many chances. But there will become a day where we really with all our hearts, minds, and soul, have to receive you and start living the life that you've given us. And my prayer is that uh, all ears would hear this message and all hearts would turn towards you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray these things. If you have a prayer need, please reach out to us, prayer request. We love to pray. We love to pray for others. We have a long, long list of prayers that we pray almost daily against the list. And we've seen a lot of prayers answered. So we know God exists. We know God hears our prayers. And we know God will answer our prayers in His will. So if you have a prayer request, please reach out to us. Uh, www.ltsministries.org uh, you can get to the website you can put a prayer request in there uh, you can get my personal information if you don't want to put something out you don't want to send me an email if you want to send me a text or something or call me um, we're always available to serve God with that have a blessed day have a blessed uh, week and may the Lord just continue to breathe life into you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen.